Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to this parallel session on leadership and management. So this is one of the 10 sessions under the hospital operations track of the first National Hospital Week Research Forum. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the medical center chiefs and other officers of the different hospitals as well as our presenters and participants in this session. So my name is Erickson Feliciano of the Health Facility Development Bureau, and I am your session chair for this track. With me is Ms. Rovi Ann Pasqua, our session coordinator. So just a brief background, the call for abstracts for this research forum resulted in 212 submissions. These submissions underwent uh, stringent screening and selection process in uh, in our office. And in this session, we have acquaint or we shall acquaint ourselves with uh, three researchers that have successfully qualified for presentation. So each of the researcher presenters in the session shall have 15 minutes to present their papers. After, we shall have 10 minutes to answer questions from our audience. The audience uh, is on mute in the entire session, but you can post your questions on the chat panel for this virtual session room. Okay, so you can see the button that will open the chat panel at the bottom of your screen. So maximum of one question per presenter only, please. But uh, kind of identify the presenter first and then type in your questions next. Okay, so flashed on your screens are the different presenters or the different researches for our uh, hospital operations tracks on leadership and management. Allow me to introduce them one by one. So the presenters in this session are as follows. First is uh, Ms. Gladys S. Guevara from Dr. Paulino J. Garcia Memorial Research and Medical Center. The title of her research paper is Perception of Nurses on the Leadership Styles of Nurse Managers in Tertiary Hospital in Nueva Ecija. This will be followed by the presentation of Dr. Danilo Andro S. Garcia Jr. from Lucena United Doctors Hospital and Medical Center with the title of the paper, An Action Research on the Emergency Room Department Overcrowding at Lucena United Doctors Hospital and Medical Center at Time of Pandemic. And last but certainly not the least is Dr. Nicolo Andre A. Anionuevo from Asian Hospital and Medical Center with the research the Nursing Virtual Platform, or NVP, leading innovation in nursing education and practice during COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, so let us now proceed with the first presentation. The floor is yours, ma'am. Good day to the audience listening to this first National Hospital Week Research Forum. I am very grateful to be given this opportunity to present my research title entitled Perception of Nurses on the Leadership Styles of Nurse Managers in a Tertiary Hospital in Nueva Ecija. I am Gladys Santos Guevara, a nurse three from Dr. Paulina J. Garcia Memorial Research and Medical Center. It is a 400 bed capacity tertiary hospital located in Cabanatuan City in Nueva Ecija. As a background, have you ever wondered why some nursing staff are more productive under a particular nurse manager as compared to others who performs poorly and not motivated at all? If you are a head of a hospital, how would you know if your nurse managers are ready to take on higher responsibilities? These are some of the basic questions in my research. After all, Nurse leadership is pivotal because nurses represent the largest discipline or the largest workforce in the hospital. And leadership is the most influential factor in shaping an organization. And not only the nurse leadership influences the job satisfaction of the junior nurses, but eventually the future of the organization as a whole. It was here in 2018 when Dr. Paulina J. Garcia Memorial Research and Medical Center Nursing Management has started to implement a policy of greater empowerment among six nurse managers, particularly the nurse tree level. These nurse tree are gradually being given 
increasing autonomy and responsibility for decision making in their respective unit. However, it has been observed that these current nursery managers are not yet prepared to take on higher responsibilities and they need leadership guidance coming from their superiors. For this new policy of greater empowerment of nurse managers to succeed, a more focused capacity building program needs to be formulated to improve the leadership skills of these existing nurse tree managers. And to develop such a capacity building program, the very first step is to determine the leadership styles of nurse tree managers in Dr. PJG MRMC. This study covered three leadership styles in the literature, namely, number one is transformational leadership, in which the leader exhibits vision, charisma, risk-taking, out-of-the-box thinking, and an aptitude for motivating others while acting as a role model and, mon and mentor their junior staff nurses. Number two is transactional leadership, in which the leader have a greater focus on rewarding employees through verbal praises and public recognition. And the last is the lazy fair leadership in which there is an absence of a purposeful interaction between the leader and the follower. And the leader avoids making decision, abdicates responsibility, and do not use his or her authority. Hence, the objective of my research is to determine the leadership styles of nurse tree managers in Dr. PJG RMC Hospital based on the perception of staff nurses. For the methodology, the study commenced after the issuance of ethics clearance coming from the Institutional Review Board of Dr. PJG RMC. I utilized the whole population of clinical nurse too based on the master staffing list of nurses. Included in the study are all nurse two working in clinical areas as of December 2018. A total of 120 nurse two answered the survey coming from the different clinical areas, such as the ob ward, the medical ward, the JATIC ward, and the OR of Dr. PJGMRMC. Excluded in the study are the ones on training and on leave. This nurse tool accomplished a structured and validated multi-factor leadership questionnaire based from Feldman. Their answers were being summarized and tabulated using a descriptive statistics. The participants were able to answer the question, the questionnaires for 15 minutes. For the results and discussion, this study found out that transformational and transactional leadership styles is often practiced by nurse managers in Dr. PJGM RMC, while laser fair leadership is rarely practiced. This study shows the leadership styles of nurse managers as perceived by their staff nurses. This is based on the calculated mean response of 3.33 for transformational leadership in which it is the highest score. Not far behind is the transactional leadership with a mean response of 3.05. And the last is the lazy fair leadership with a mean response of 0 0.73. A score between 0 0.0 to 0 0.50 would mean that that particular leadership style is never exhibited while 0 0.5, 51 to 1.50 would mean that this leadership style is rarely exhibited. 1.51 to 2.50, it is sometimes exhibited. 2.51 to 3.50, it is often exhibited. And the last, 3.51 to 4.0 would mean that this particular leadership style is always exhibited. The reasons for the perception of staff nurses differs or varies by leadership style. Staff nurses who rated their nurse manager's leadership style as transformational 
primarily think that, number one, their nurse managers acted as their role models, inspired confidence in them, and motivates them, and gives them a sense of purpose. On the other hand, some staff nurses who rated their nurse managers as having transactional leadership did so because these nurse managers reward their employees through verbal praises and public recognition for a job well done. While staff nurses rated their nurse manager's leadership style as lazy fare because they think that their nurse managers avoided action until the problem is already worse. This slide shows the top reasons cited by the nursing staff on why they think a particular nurse manager exhibits the above mentioned leadership styles as I, pretend, as I presented in the previous slides. For the transformational leadership, the one that has the highest mean response is that their nurse managers acted as their role model, followed by their nurse managers inspired confidence in them and motivates them with a mean response of 3.35. For transactional leadership, the one that has the highest mean response is that their nurse managers rewards them for a job well done. And for the lazy fair leadership, the, the nurse, the nurse, the staff nurse think that the nurse managers avoided action until the problem is already worse with a mean response of 0 0.85. For the conclusion, this study found out that transformational and transactional leadership style is practiced often by nurse managers in Dr. PJGMRMC, while laser fair leadership is rarely practiced. This means that the nurse managers of Dr. PJGMRMC have a higher potential to lead, to mentor, and to empower the lower ranked staff nurses of the hospital. And they do have a high degree of prejudice for greater autonomy and responsibility, and maybe occupy a higher position in the hospital in the future. However, the study also found out that few of the nurse managers exhibited a laissez-faire type of leadership. Hence, this study recommends for the nursing division of Dr. PJGM RMC to enhance and update its training program for nurse managers, which include leadership training, coaching and mentoring, and the last would be the risk management. Thank you. That would be all. Thank you very much, Ms. Guevara, for that wonderful research uh, paper from Dr. Paulino J. Garcia Memorial Research and Medical Center. So Ms. Guevara will be able to answer your questions later after all the presentations. So type in your questions in our chat box. Thank you once again, Ms. Guevara. For our second uh, research presenter, may I call on Dr. Danilo Andro S. Garcia, Jr., from Lucena United Doctors Hospital and Medical Center, again with the title of his paper, An Action Research on the Emergency Room Department Overcrowding at Lucena United Doctors Hospital and Medical Center at the time of pan pandemic. Over, Dr. Danilo. Good afternoon, everyone, especially to the organizers of this first National Hospital Week Research Forum. It is really an honor for me to be one of the presenters for this occasion and at this point, I will be presenting our research entitled An Action Research on the Emergency Room Department Overcrowding at China United Doctors Hospital and Medical Center. I am your presenter, Dr. Danilo Andro S. Garcia, Jr., the Chief of Ancillary Service of the China United Doctors Hospital and Medical Center. My co-author for this research is Dr. Juan Eugenio Fidel B. Villanueva. For the introduction, the emergency room of a hospital serves as a catching area for patients seeking medical needs. It is one of the busiest sites in the hospital and are often populated with patients, the relatives, and most of the healthcare workers. The current challenges in the emergency room is the volume of patients that causes overcrowding. It was perceived that it is mainly due to lack of private rooms. Nowadays, the demand and supplies for private homes and COVID wards 
has been the topic of interest for various hospitals. ER overcrowding has big impact to employees and patients' satisfaction, and it also contributes significantly to hospital service satisfaction. For the background of the study, Overcrowding has been observed in the emergency room of our hospital, the Lusani United Doctors Hospital and Medical Center. It was witnessed that patients stayed for more than four hours at the ER, and it was not a good sight to see overcrowding patients and relatives at one area. To address the issue, the management of LEDHMC are motivated to conduct this study to truly assess the situation and find out suitable solutions for the current situation. Thus, this study was conducted. For the conceptual framework, we use the Colan and Granit four step spiral model of action research. It includes evaluating action, diagnosing, planning action, and taking action on a various cycles. After that, we use the realistic ORJI cycle that involves observation, emotional reaction, judgment, and intervention. The objectives of the study are the following. First, to identify the causes of the ER overcrowding. Second, to review the existing policies and guidelines, including infrastructures that contributory to the problem from January to February 2019. And third, to find solution to the identified problem. For the methods, this study is a descriptive action research. Mostly qualitative data are involved. The population of this study are the hospital employees, particularly the ER staff, and we use purposive sampling. For the scope, the problem is ER overcrowding, and this was conducted from January 2019 to January 2021 at Senate United Doctors Hospital and Medical Center. The data gathering methodology are interview, policy review, and observation, and the respondents are the hospital employees. For the data gathering procedure, First, we secure consent from the management of the Senate United Doctors Hospital and Medical Center. This research was supported by the management of LED HMC and the board of LEDI. Second, we formulate the Gantt chart of activities, after which we perform data gathering and all the data collected are collated and we apply a statistical analysis and we formulate corrective actions and it was then recommended to the management of LEDHMC and the board of LEDI. For the results and discussions, the table one, as you can see on your screen, presents the causes of ER overcrowding based on the data from interview, policy review, and observation. In the early months of 2019, the ER staff noted a typical emergence of situations during their team huddle. There are around 12 observations as to the causes of ER overcrowding, but this can be summarized into three, such as the increasing number of patients in the emergency room, the working spaces at the ER are too small, and the resources and supplies are limited. Table 2 in the results and discussions presents the realistic ORJI for the first cause, which is there are too many patients at the emergency department. And the top two interventions are the following. We should offer services for stable or non-emergent patients deemed for OPD consult and advise room reservations for patients who cannot wait at the emergency room for a span of time until the room is available. And for our judgment, I think it is not unusual that there is an increased bulk of patients arriving at the emergency room. This corresponds to a rise in the percentage of people getting ill or awareness of the need for consultation for a particular sign and symptoms. The next is table three. It shows the realistic ORJI for the, the working space is too small as the patient pool at the emergency room department. For our judgment, we made a judgment that insufficient work area 
poses a distress to staff and the patients. All emergency room staff find it challenging to walk swiftly to meet the demands of the patient in a GP. And as to the patients, they perceive this area congestion is not conducive for care and healing. And for the top two interventions, as our unit manager regarding the need for ER possible expansion, and second, to maximize the use of hallways and alcoves to cater patients. Table four is the realistic ORJI or supplies and resources at the emergency room that are limited. For our judgment, we think that it is necessary to maintain an adequate number of supplies and equipment to maintain a smooth emergency room process flow. And the top two interventions are coordinated the pharmacy for procurement of additional medications and second, to monitor supplies in a per shift basis. Table five are the summary of agreed interventions. Few, uh, um, few of these interventions are the pandemic to review wards that can still accommodate additional beds, boarding, hallway beds, open up a new spaces like the old conference room and the old ASCO CCU, down to number 11, which is to fast track patient billing for patient for discharge, and number 12, construction of additional 18 private rooms. Figure three is the number of patients that stayed more than four hours at the emergency room after all the interventions for the top three identified causes are made. It shows that um, the line, the line drop is decreasing. It means that the number of patients that stayed for more than four hours at the emergency room is decreasing. For the results and discussion, after we find out that the number of patients that stayed for more than four hours at the emergency room is decreasing, we propose the operational framework for the ER, as you can see in your screen, that is uh, composed of the input, the throughput, and the output. And for the conclusion of our study, this is just the conclusion for the first part of this study, which is the qualitative portion. Conclusion number one, the major causes around 80% of ER overcrowding are too many volume of patients, too small working space, limited supplies and resources. Number two, policies and guidelines that are modified are policy on admission, referral from other hospital and discharge of patients. And number three, the major solutions are additional rooms, supply chain management, and improvement of patients' turnaround time on discharge. For the recommendations or policy implications, first, the management recommended to construct additional 18 private rooms. Second, it is recommended to increase the capacity or the size of the emergency room. And third, it is recommended to utilize the proposed operational framework for emergency room. These are some of the references. And once again, thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Danilo, for that uh, research paper on the or addressing the overcrowding of our emergency rooms, particularly in your hospital. So for the last presenter for this leadership and management track, but certainly uh, not the least, to present the study, the Nursing Virtual Platform or MVP, Leading Innovation in Nursing Education and Practice During COVID-19 Pandemic, may I call on Dr. Nicolo Andre A. Añanuevo. All right, thank you for that acknowledgement. Good afternoon, everyone. Apologies for the delay. Allow me to present to you our quality improvement project entitled The Nursing Virtual Platform, Leading Innovation in Nursing Education and Practice During COVID-19 Pandemic. I am the presenter today. I am Nicolo Andre A. Añanuevo. I am the Senior Manager for Nursing Recruitment, Training, Development, and Research of the Asian Hospital and Medical Center. With me are my co-authors, John Joseph S. Rieta, MSN, RN, 
our manager for nursing training and development, and Dr. Adrian M. Lucine, DNMRN, our manager for research and nursing data analytics. So for the background, COVID-19 prevented student nurses to pursue their related learning experience in the hospital. Actually, as we are having this first national hospital a week celebration today, two years after the pandemic, the student nurses are still prevented from having their actual related learning experience in their based hospital or affiliating hospital. With that, there is actually a potential effect of COVID-19 health crisis among students. This includes a potential gap in terms of their knowledge, skills, and attitude. However, here in Asian Hospital and Medical Center, through transformational leadership, we always turn gaps, difficulties, challenges into an opportunity. With that, we saw that indeed there is an opportunity to work on or improve on the knowledge, skills, and attitude of our student nurses who are the future nurses of the world. With that, is uh, during the first uh, Sci Beta uh, webinar, the concept was uh, first presented. The title of my concept during that time was Virtual Tour, a New Nursing learning space, which was presented in the, as a concept in the Sigma Psi Beta Chapter International Webinar last August 25, 2020. During my presentation in the Psi Beta Webinar, I've presented a concept wherein virtually we can actually bring the student nurses in the actual patient care areas of Asian Hospital and Medical Center. So after my presentation, several deans of the Colleges of Nursing approached me, and the rest is actually history. So after several consultative meetings, planning, and after uh, several uh, runs of our platform was the birth of our nursing virtual platform. On your screen right now, I'm happy to share with you the framework of our nursing virtual platform. Now, everyone, it all starts with lessons from the classrooms and the books. The nursing virtual platform is a supplemental platform because we all know that our dear professors and clinical instructors already discussed the lessons virtually online on the learning management system of the university. The lessons from the classroom and the books will now be translated into an actual ideal setup. The responsibility of the nursing virtual platform of the Asian Hospital and Medical Center is to virtually bring the student nurses to the actual ideal setup and share to the student nurses how we ideally practice our nursing practices here utilizing the virtual platform depending on the nursing specialization that we are focusing into like for example if the focus is critical care nursing the responsibility of the nurse educator specifically specializing in critical care nursing is to bring virtually our student nurses and participants to our actual cardiovascular intensive care unit or medical intensive care unit or even our neonatal intensive care unit. Moreover, if the school uh, requests for perioperative nursing, my nurse educator Fabian for perioperative services will bring the student nurses and participants inside our perioperative services. So that is actually the uniqueness of our learning virtual platform. It is not being conducted in a simulation room. It is not being conducted inside a classroom with all due respect with other learning management systems. But I'd like to highlight that our nursing virtual platform virtually brings the participants in the actual patient care areas of Asian Hospital and Medical Center anchored on the Joint Commission International Accreditation so that 
that will actually render student positive gain in terms of their knowledge, skills, and attitude. The platform focuses on the key, the three key aspects, right? The knowledge, skills, and attitude, because in order for us to produce a holistic nurse, it should actually encompass the knowledge, skills, and attitude. So that when this student nurses are actually deployed in the hospital, it will not be very difficult for them to transition. Because as early as now, despite the pandemic, we still find times on how to bring them inside the hospital, gaining their much needed related learning experience. So that the output of which is a positive patient safety. That is actually the end goal of the nursing virtual platform to bridge the gap between what's written in the book, how it is translated to actual ideal practice here in Asian Hospital and Medical Center anchored in Joint Commission International Standards, thereby producing positive outcome. And we all know that patient safety and nursing science is anchored on science. It is never stagnant. So therefore, it is continuous process for us to bridge the gap between what's written in the book and how it is translated. Now, moving along, the objectives is to identify the effectiveness of nursing virtual platform as an alternative related learning experience modality for nursing students during the COVID-19 pandemic through participant evaluation, thereby leading schools of nursing and hospitals in coordinated um, new teaching technology. So what's the method? A first in the landscape of nursing education in the Philippines during COVID-19 health crisis, the nursing virtual platform offers an alternative learning modality that aims to bridge the gap between books and classroom discussions and how these are translated to actual and ideal nursing practice in a hospital accredited by the Joint Commission International, the global leader in quality and patient safety in healthcare. The platform utilizes recorded videos, some of which are actually live demonstrations and highly interactive discussions facilitated by Asian hospitals experienced nurse educators on their specialization. Because my nurse educators here in Asian hospital are not generalists. They are practicing based on their specialization. Like for example, for maternal and child, our nurse educator there is um, Karen. For emergency nursing, that's actually Janice. For oncology, that's actually Jera. For medical surgical, that is actually Lisa. So our nurse educators here are practicing depending on their nursing specialization. So moreover, the nursing virtual platform systematically focuses on selected courses of the nursing curriculum in close coordination with the academic leaders that features Asian hospitals' best practices. For the results and discussions, since October 2020, since the launch of our nursing virtual platform, our platform hosted over 2,000 students from 10 universities across Metro Manila, South Luzon, and Naga for both private and state university. We started with five um, school partners, but 10 months after the birth of our nursing virtual platform, we're able to double. And as of, as of today, there are school of nursing that are actually waiting in line for our memorandum of agreement with basic and highly specialized topics such as fully catheterization, suctioning, intravenous therapy, COVID-19 PPE, and ICU nursing setups. Our nursing virtual platform had been highly successful in virtually immersing nursing students and their professors. Um, allow me to share some of the actual screenshots of our nursing virtual platform. If you will see on your screen now, there's an IV therapy. In the middle is Lisa giving her actual live demonstration of her IV therapy utilizing the infusion pump. Here naman is our high-risk pregnancy intervention that will bring you inside our Genesis Center or our labor and delivery. Uh, for maternal and fetal monitoring, that's phototherapy in our neonatal intensive care unit. This is an example of how we conduct our telemetry nursing, attaching or having a demonstration of how to hook the patient in 
uh, telemetry transmitter. On the other hand, the man is the nasogastric tube insertion. And for the results, using a standardized four-point scale evaluation tool accessible online after each session, student participants provided both qualitative and quantitative assessment of the nursing virtual platform in terms of its program content, program management tools, speakers, and overall learning experience. Our nursing virtual platform received an excellent average overall rating of 3.92 across all evaluative domains from all nursing virtual platforms. In addition, content and narrative analysis of the qualitative data showed that the program had been profoundly helpful. For our conclusion, as I end my presentation, our nursing virtual platform is an effective alternative learning method for students as evidenced by an overwhelmingly positive feedback highlighted by the strength of the program's learning contents, virtual tools, which virtual tools and speakers in delivering a highly effective learning experience. For our recommendations and policy implications, leading others in the implementation of new online teaching and learning experience, our nursing virtual platform can be implemented to the nursing schools and may serve as a benchmark for other programs. Continuous curricular and framework improvement through research and evaluation, and lastly, extending our nursing virtual platform from an undergraduate to a graduate student framework. I'm also proud to share to each and every one of you this afternoon that last May, we're able to launch our Master of Arts in Nursing clinical residency focusing on major in maternal and child health nursing in one of the biggest universities in Manila. And to add to that, we are currently in communication towards the creation of our nursing virtual platform for Doctor of Philosophy in Nursing Practicum, and again, one of the big universities in Manila. So with that, for collaborations about our nursing virtual platform or nursing practices, allow me to end my presentation with my contact details. This is my email, my Facebook, my Instagram, my LinkedIn, and my personal mobile number. Congratulations, Department of Health, for the first ever research forum. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Sir Nicolo, for that uh, concise yet very informative uh, discussion of the Nursing Virtual Platform initiative of your institution, the Asian Hospital and Medical Center. So again, I'd like to thank all the presenters and now let us proceed or let us hear the questions from our audience. Once again, I'd like to introduce you to our coordinator, Ms. Rovian Pasqua, who monitored our chat panel and uh, she selected at least one question for each of the presenters. But hopefully, we'll be able to find time to answer uh, your other questions. Okay, so though... Ms. Guevara has already provided her answer, but let me just uh, read the question so might be for further explanation of the first presenter. So for the first question, what will be the main significance of your study? So this pertains to uh, the first presenter, Ms. Guevara, and who will benefit most from your paper? May I ask the presenters to turn on their cameras? Go ahead, Ms. Guevara. Thank you, Sir Eric. Um, as I have stated earlier, it was year 2018 when the nursing division uh, top management started uh, to implement a policy of uh, greater empowerment among its nurse managers. These nurse three managers were given um, greater responsibility and autonomy when it comes to decision making in their respective units. However, um, uh, they noticed that uh, these nursery managers are not yet ready to take on higher responsibilities and need more guidance coming from their superiors. So, after uh, observing this, um, the first step to, to make this uh, policy a successful one is to determine the leadership styles of these current nurse managers. And this study will assess the readiness of these uh, 
current uh, nursery managers to take on greater autonomy and responsibility under the new policy of uh, empowering them to effectively deliver the mandate of the organization, which is the nursing division. And uh, also the findings of this study will contribute on how to better capacitate and update the training program for the nurse managers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Guevara. I hope I that, that answered. There is a last question for this one. Who would benefit the most from uh, this um, study? Um, for that, uh, for that uh, second question, I think this study would benefit most the client and uh, the client's uh, relatives of Dr. PJJ MRMC that we are serving because uh, uh, they will receive a quality nursing care delivered from this better and capacitated and empowered uh, nurse managers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Guevara. Well said because really leadership and management, at least in the nursing service, is very important for us to improve the delivery of our care to our patients. So thank you again for answering that question. Okay, I can also see in the Q&A box a question for the last presenter, si Sir Nicolo, Dr. Anyo Nuevo. So the question is from Professor Joss from the Department of Health National Center for Mental Health. He would like to ask you uh, that, he mentioned that that's a great innovation, but the question is, he wanted to know the weakness of the virtual program versus the traditional program that you have. Yes, um, of course, one of the weakness is the students doesn't have an actual demonstration. They just observe how we actually do it, right? But at least at the end of the day, there's something that we can actually offer to our students. The, the book on uh, nursing education, one of the books of the nursing education indicates that the retention rate should be at 90% when the student uh, nurses perform it. However, that is one of the limitations of our nursing virtual platform because by just seeing and uh, looking into our best practices, the retention rate is actually up for 50 to 70%. That's that's good as compared to nothing, right? Because as of the moment, when the student nurses are actually prevented from having their related learning experience, that's the best that we can provide to them. Might as well virtually bring them inside the hospital as compared to just nothing. Thank you, Sir Nicolo. Uh, I know that this uh, paper is very timely because it actually bridges the gap between theory and practice, especially now, the time of the pandemic we're in very limited time is given to students to practice their clinical uh, uh, experiences. But I'm, I'd like with your indulgence to ask you another question. Uh, was there any particular uh, chance that you that you were able to assess the performance of these students or nursing graduates in the clinical areas? And what do you think is the effect of the MVP to their actual performance in the duties? Yes. So with regards to their actual performance in terms of their skills, that's the limitation of the platform. Because again, there's an administrative order wherein the students are prevented from having their actual um, clinical duty. So that's one of the limitations of the platform. But highlighting on the strengths of the platform, the platform actually brings the students virtually to different uh, nursing specializations in the hospital despite the pandemic. Okay, um, remember uh, perioperative nursing, our um, genesis center, our labor and delivery areas, our critical care nursing, our telemetry nursing. Those are some of the highlights of the nursing virtual platform wherein we're able to bring the student nurses virtually to our actual patient care areas. Not simulation rooms, not classrooms, we are able to share with them utilizing our um, mid-fidelity simulators, um, the actual areas. We bring our simulators to the intensive care unit if that's the need, to our operating room if that's the need. Thank you very much, Dr. Nicolo, for sharing to the Department of Health the initiatives of your institution. Okay, you, so sir. for... You're welcome. For Dr. Garcia, I'm, I'd like to ask you one question. So a majority of the causes of the ER overcrowding that you have mentioned pointed to hard components uh, 
such as the physical structures. There are too many patients in the ER, very small working space and limited supplies. Uh, I'd like to ask, sir, if uh, there was any particular parang soft component or soft uh, particular cause such as operations in terms of operations or processes or systems that lead to overcrowding, aside from the physical structures that you mentioned or physical problem that you mentioned. Do we have those other types of uh, causes for ER overcrowding? Thank you so much, sir. Um, that is also related to one of the questions in the chat box. Uh, the question stated that there are too many relatives inside the ER, and I think that's one of my answers, sir. Um, it was observed by the ER staff that um, more than two relatives enter the emergency room together with the patients. So what we do is that we review the existing policy, and then we do changes, we do some modifications, and after that, we strictly implement the up to two or maximum of two relatives that could enter the emergency room. And if the patient um, is more likely stable, only one relative is allowed inside the emergency room. Then we provided a waiting area and a space outside the emergency room where other relatives can stay because we cannot control them, especially if uh, I, Either one patient will come inside, you cannot stop the five relatives that uh, may come together with the patient. So I think that's one of the causes why there is ER overcrowding. And after three months of implementation of the 80% um, interventions that we think are the solutions, um, there is major changes in the ER overcrowding. Thank you very much, Doctor, for that uh, response. So we look forward for the continuous improvement in terms of your delivery of services in the emergency room. So that's a very uh, wonderful research paper. Okay, so I think that's all the time that we have for the Q&A. All your posted questions, may it be addressed or not by our presenters earlier, shall be included in the documentation of this activity. And here are the few words for the synthesis of this session. Leadership and management is key to successful organization. It serves as the foundation and provides direction for our organization. We learned so much from our three presenters who in their respective uh, researches in their own hospitals exemplify how leaders and managers impact hospital operations. First, we were able to listen to Nurse Gladys S. Guevara of Dr. Paulino J. Garcia Memorial Research and Medical Center, where she shared with us the perception of nurses of the different leadership styles of nurse managers in the tertiary hospital. So based on the study, transformational and transactional leadership styles are often practiced uh, by our nurse managers. We also emphasize the high potential of the nurse managers to lead and empower their staff for greater responsibility and autonomy. For our second presenter, Dr. Danilo Andro Garcia gave us an action research on the emergency room department overcrowding in the Lucena Doctors Hospital and Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Garcia presented to us the current challenges in the ER, as well as the level of satisfaction of both patients and the employees. Interestingly, his action research identified that high volume of patients having a very small working space and limited supplies and resources are major causes of ER overcrowding. The study leads to some policy recommendations to increase emergency room capacity and improve patient turnaround time. And lastly, the Asian Hospital and Medical Center, so Dr. Nicolo Andre Anyonuevo showcased the nursing virtual platform of the hospital as the leading innovation in nursing education and practice during COVID-19 pandemic. His study concluded that the said innovation is an effective alternative learning methodology for students. The Nursing Virtual Platform, or NVP, is recommended to be implemented in nursing schools and may also serve as benchmark for other programs. And that's all that we have for this parallel session on leadership and management of the hospital operations track of the first National Hospital Research Forum. A round of virtual applause to our three great presenters this afternoon. Thank you very much for sharing your time and your uh, wonderful research paper. So we hope that we'll be able to apply the learnings that we got from you in our respective institutions. Okay, so just uh, some announcements. Make sure that you are able to log on to your next parallel session after this one. As some of you may be aware, there are 30 papers out of 60 
presented in this forum that are in the running for the best research paper. The winners will be announced and awarded at the closing plenary session of the forum. I think that's tomorrow and we also expect all of you to join them. Okay, so before the first National Hospital Week Research Forum formally closes, the link to the post-activity evaluation form will be announced and posted. And all of those who will be able to fill up the online post-activity evaluation will receive their certificate of attendance in return. Again, this parallel session has concluded. Thank you very much for your participation and see you all at the closing and awarding ceremony.